In this video, I'm going to review my basic search pattern and approach to reading an MRI of the lumbar spine. I'll talk first a little bit about the sequences. I'll then go through my search pattern and I'll end the video with a few example cases. So a lot of reading and interpreting an MRI correctly has to do with knowing how to use the different sequences. If you understand what the different sequences show, you can then understand how to make important findings that you can then communicate to the ordering provider. So to start out first, I'll explain just briefly some of the things I look at on the particular sequences and some of the things that you can hone in on with these certain sequences and know that you're setting yourself up to make the right findings. So what I have pulled up here first is a T1. This is more specifically a sagittal T1 of the lumbar spine. I know this is T1 because the CSF or cerebrospinal fluid is dark. One of the things that T1 is useful for is assessing the bones. You wanna make sure that the bone marrow signal is normal. And if you see any change in the signal, and when I say change in the signal, more specifically, if there is dark signal within the bones, either focal, like in the setting of a lesion, or just diffusely, you have to think about pathology. If it's focal, you start thinking about a lesion, like a metastasis, particularly in an older patient, or a primary bone lesion, perhaps. If there's diffuse loss of bone marrow signal, there could be some sort of hematologic process, significant anemia, there's a long list of different that I'm not going to get into, but you want to make sure that the bone marrow signal on your T1 is normal. The bones in this case are normal, so this is a good example of normal bone marrow signal. And if you see anything darker than the paraspinal musculature, this is the muscle here. So anything darker on T1 than the muscle within the bone is pathologic, and you need to mention it. There are plenty of benign bone things as well. A lot of the benign things will be bright on T1. So if you see a bone lesion that's bright on T1, classically like a hemangioma, that is a benign, harmless lesion almost always, and you don't need to worry about those. So it's the dark things on the T1 within the bone that you have to worry about. I look in the spinal canal on every sequence. The spinal canal lies between the vertebral bodies and the posterior elements. Running down this way, you have the CSF, which is dark, and then you have the neural tissue. In the lumbar spine, you get a little bit of the cord followed by the cauda equina nerve roots. There really isn't great spatial resolution on this sagittal image, so we'll talk about the nerve roots and the cord when we get to the T2 section, which is where I really look at the nervous tissue a little more closely. Some examples of pathology within the canal that you need to be aware of. In the setting of trauma, worry about blood, specifically epidural hemorrhage. This can actually happen spontaneously in patients on anticoagulation. Then you have the infectious and inflammatory things. With infection, you have phlegmon, which is enhancing soft tissue that's infectious. And then one step beyond that is abscess, where there's actually a peripherally enhancing collection. Those three things, blood, phlegmon, and abscess, are going to be the three most common things to think about when you see collections within the canal. I then change over to my T2. Briefly, when talking about the T2 sagittal, I look at the distal part of the cord, which is the conus medullaris, which I see here, and then you see the cauda equina nerve roots that span the rest of the lumbosacral spine. You should get an axial T2, and I'll pull up the axial T2 later to show these in cross-section, where you can look at them a little bit more closely. In addition to looking at the cord and cauda equina, I again look in the fecal sac, looking for the different pathologies that can exist within predominantly the epidural space. That's where stuff usually happens. I also look at the discs. Here are discs here, thinking about their height. If there is edema within the discs, and something like discitis osteomyelitis, these are all the discs here. You can then look at the end plates. These are the end plates. It's just the margins of the vertebral bodies. If you see edema within those, most of the time it's degenerative, but if the disc has a lot of edema, there's edema within the end plates, kind of contiguous with the disc that is inflamed. You have to start worrying about something like discitis osteomyelitis. In that case, you'd have post-contrast images, which is going a bit beyond this video. I also like to look at the neural foramen on the T2. These are the foramen here. This is where the nerve roots exit the canal and eventually reach their destinations within the body. What I have pulled up now is the STIR sequence. I think of STIR as the edema sequence. So things that are bright on STIR are edema. So if you see edema within the bones, think fracture, think infection, like a discitis osteomyelitis again. The STIR sequence is really useful in trauma in assessing the ligaments. If you see hyperintensity within the ligaments, you can start thinking about ligamentous injury. STIR is really just the best sequence at looking at edema, and that is edema everywhere, including within the cord. So if you see hyperintensity, within the cord or of the nerve roots, you have to start thinking about some sort of acute process going on. Hyperintensity within the cord, think infarct, radiation, neoplasm, 
or demyelination. That's a good differential for things that cause hyperintensity within the cord. Again, within the vertebral bodies, that could be fracture, that could be discitis osteomyelitis, or potentially a tumor, either a primary bone tumor or a metastasis. Tumors have associated edema that would show up on STIR. So again, not to hammer it in too much, but STIR is good at looking for edema. Edema is usually associated with pathology. So just think of STIR as your sequence to identify the pathology. Look for brightness. Brightness implies edema, inflammation, which then implies pathology. Finally, you have the axial T2 sequence. I talked about the sagittal T2 and looking particularly at the cord and the nerve roots. The axial T2, as I'm scrolling through, you can see the individual nerve roots a little bit better. Here are all the little tiny nerve roots here. So this is distal to the cord. The cord's already ended and we just have the tiny nerve roots. If the nerve roots are compressed at all, patients generally have pain or some other neurologic symptom like paresthesias or weakness. So assessing the individual roots as you're going up and down is important. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm scrolling through looking at the cauda equina nerve roots. And you can see them one by one, group by group, exit the fecal sac and enter the neural foramen. So I'm now going to explain my search pattern when reading an MRI of the lumbar spine. I start with the T1. Again, with the T1, I think about the bones. But before I get to the bones, I think about alignment. So when I talk about alignment, I'm looking for lysthesis, which is movement of a vertebral body with respect to another. Specifically, if a vertebral body is shifted anteriorly with respect to the one below it, that's called anterolysthesis. And the opposite of that is retrolysthesis, where a vertebral body is shifted posteriorly with respect to the one below it. This usually happens in the setting of degeneration, but in the setting of trauma, you can have an acute lysthesis either anterolysthesis or retrolysthesis, and that can imply a ligamentous injury. So I start off with the alignment. I then, of course, assess the bone marrow. Like I talked about earlier, T1 is good for bone marrow, so I'm looking at all the signal within the bones of the lumbosacral spine. Don't forget to check the sacrum. That is a common place for insufficiency fractures in your older patients. I then move on to my T2. Here's the T2 sagittal. I look at the disc space height. I talked about the discs earlier. I also look at the signal within the bones on T2. Look in your thecal sac. Look at your distal cord and cauda equina nerve roots. I'm doing that now. I'm looking at the nerves as they're in the neural foramens, which are here. And we'll get to what stenosis of one of those can look like later. I then switch over to my axials and start looking at each level. Each level of the lumbar spine has different places where pathology can exist. The first thing is just within the thecal sac. Here is the thecal sac here. Different pathologies can cause compression of the nerves within this area, and that can cause symptoms in patients. And that's what you call canal stenosis. Alternatively, another place you can have pathology is the lateral recess. And the lateral recess, also called the subarticular zone, is this area here. It's right next to the facet joint. This is the facet joint here where the two vertebral bodies articulate. Pathology here can a lot of times cause compression of the lateral recess or subarticular zone, which is a place where the descending nerve roots exist for a particular level. So for instance, if you're at the L4, L5 level, the subarticular zone or lateral recess contains the descending L5 nerve root. In addition to disease within the facet joint compressing the lateral recess, you can also have disc pathology that compresses the lateral recess nerves, which can also cause certain symptoms for patients. So I look at the canal and lateral recess at every single level in the axial. You can also look at the neural foramen for every level in the axial plane. I actually like to do this more back on the sagittal. So as I'm going through level by level, I'm looking at the axials and then I'm looking back at the sagittals and I'm comparing the different levels. And I'm using both to kind of help me make an assessment of how narrow these certain structures are. Is there mild stenosis? Is there severe stenosis? Or is there no stenosis at all? So I'm really going back and forth between the sagittal and axial. So I'm going to go back to the sagittal and show you the neural foramen. So this is the neural foramen here. I've talked about it already. You can see at each level, another neural frame in here, another neural frame in here, the exiting nerve root is visible. So this is the nerve that I'm circling now at every level. And you can see this exiting nerve root is present in the neural foramen. Pathology within the foramen can cause compression of the nerve roots, which then cause symptoms in patients. So the whole goal of reading an MRI of the lumbar spine is seeing how narrow certain places are, be it the canal, subarticular zone or the foramen and trying to identify which thing is causing patient's symptoms. Is it compression of the exiting L4 nerve root? Is it 
the severe canal stenosis at 2-3. A lot of times it's a bunch of different things because the degenerating spine has disease at multiple levels. So this case I've been showing you now is an example of a normal MRI of the lumbar spine. So there's not a significant stenosis. The subarticular zones, the canal, the foramen are all patent or not compressed. I'm now going to show you some example cases where there is disease to get an idea of what pathology looks like. So what I have pulled up here now is a sagittal T2 MRI of the lumbar spine. And I want you to notice the L4, L5 level here. This is your disc here. And the disc is actually extending beyond where it normally does and it's protruding into the canal. So this is disc, this is a disc extrusion. And as you see here, the cauda equina nerve roots run, are running inferiorly here. And then here they're being compressed by this big disc extrusion. I'm gonna go now to the axial and show you what this looks like in the axial plane. So we're going down. This is a normal level. Notice that the fecal sac, which is right here, is wide open. You see a lot of CSF. Remember, this is T2, so it's bright. And I'm going to start scrolling down. And look at this level. Notice you go from here, everything's open. Here, everything's totally compressed. So this is your disc here. This is the margin of the disc. And this tiny sliver is the cauda equina that's being compressed by this big disc. So this is an example of severe spinal canal stenosis. So when a patient tells you they have canal stenosis, this is what they mean. Hopefully it's not this bad because this is very severe. And I'm going back to the sagittal and again showing you this is basically just a big disc that is compressing the canal and narrowing the canal to a significant extent to the point where the nerve roots are being compressed. I pulled up a different case because this is a different example of pathology that can exist and lead to stenosis within the canal. This dark structure here is the ligamentum flavum, which is one of the ligaments of the posterior aspect of the spine. In the setting of degenerative disease, this can hypertrophy and get really big. When it gets big, it can then compress the fecal sac, causing canal stenosis and also a lot of times subarticular zone stenosis. The subarticular zone, again, remember, lives kind of in this region here. So if this ligamentum flavum really thickens and then you have pathology of the facet joint, this is the facet joint here, they can cause a lot of compression of that lateral recess or subarticular zone where the descending nerve root of a certain level is present. Now what I've got pulled up here is a very helpful diagram courtesy of Radiopedia that shows the foramen. I've showed you what the foramen looks like on the actual MRI. This is just a nice illustrated example of it. This is our nerve root again here. You should have a lot of epidural fat around the nerve root. This is what this represents here as they also have labeled. You have your discs your ligamentum flavum, which I just talked about, and then your facet joints, which I've been talking about as well. All of those things can lead to pathology within the foramen. This is an example of a nice open foramen, so this is normal. But if you progress to the next image, this is what we call mild stenosis. You still have some epidural fat, but as you can see, this disc is starting to encroach upon that nerve root. That's an example of mild foraminal stenosis. One level beyond that is moderate, where there starts to be compression on multiple sides, and there's a significant loss of the epidural fat. As you can see, the nerve is kind of being pushed up against the vertebral body. There's disc coming up against it, and then the ligamentum flavum here has kind of thickened, so you start to have what we can call moderate stenosis. The nerve isn't frankly smushed or squished, but it's starting to be compressed by the surrounding structures so that neural foramen is moderately stenosed. And one step beyond moderate, of course, is then severe where you have frank compression of the nerve root. This would very likely be leading to symptoms in patients, but here we have the ligamentum flavum here. We've got the disc. Disc is herniating into the foramen. This ligamentum flavum is also compressing the nerve root and you have significant loss of the epidural fat, all of which is representation of severe foraminal stenosis where the nerve is actually being compressed. So this is a good example of what we look for on MRI for severe stenosis. For my final case now, I have a real example of severe foraminal stenosis. We just looked at a diagram. Now I wanna show you a real MRI. Look at this level here. So this is the foramen, and it's almost just hard to even see the nerve root. We've got disc that's clearly within the foramen. This is disc right here that has extruded into the foramen. The nerve root is somewhere here, but it's frankly being compressed compared to the level below here where it's open. It is very much being compressed here. There's minimal epidural fat. This brightness here is epidural fat, but the epidural fat is essentially gone just about, and the nerve root is clearly being compressed, and I would not be surprised if this patient has symptoms that reflect compression of this exiting nerve root. So that's my review of the MRI of the lumbar spine. Thank you so much for watching. Hope it helps, and see you all in the next video.